Our next speaker comes from the Michigan Department of Education. It is TJ Smolik. TJ is the Science Education Research Consultant for the Office of Standards and Assessment at the Michigan Department of Education. Prior to coming to MDE, TJ worked as a graduate researcher at Michigan State University, where she plans to graduate with her PhD in science education in 2017. She comes to, work, she comes to this work after teaching middle school science and engineering and working as an administrator. TJ also has a bachelor's of science in microbiology from the University of Evansville, a master's of arts in instruction from Central Michigan University, and a master's of education in secondary school administration from the Citadel Military College. More education than me, for sure. When not working at MDE, TJ can be found teaching dance, wrangling her four children, and writing her dissertation. Let's give a warm welcome to TJ. Thanks again for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Um, the topic I'm going to talk about today is something that's a little bit familiar maybe to some of you, and that's something I have deemed my alligator. Um, I came to this assessment work kind of by a back route. So um, first, getting into teaching, I remember being 16 and telling my folks, I will never be a teacher. And after working as a wrangler on a ranch and managing a Starbucks and managing a casino, I went to teaching. So by way of that, I ended up learning um, through my many programs that I didn't know enough about teaching. I didn't know enough about the system. I didn't know enough about administration. And I always had these questions. Why are we doing this? It doesn't make any sense. Why do I have to give my kids this test? Why are we locking down field trips in my school for the six weeks before the test so that I can help them study for it? Is it really that important? So then when I started my um, PhD program, I took an assessment course because I wanted to know more about this assessment stuff. And after taking that course, I walked out and I said, I will never do assessments. This stuff is crazy. There's no reason why we do it. So here I am. So one of the things that I have really had a passion for is looking at these new standards and thinking about how can we fill out this system of assessment that's supposed to be here. We're supposed to get this information for students from multiple resources, multiple measures, but really, we only focus on the very tip, that darn M step. And so how can we fill this out? And how can we raise assessment literacy among our educators so that they understand it's not just about that tip, right? There's this whole other alligator that we have to attack in order to be able to make this stuff work. So starting on the broadest end, we have formative assessment, right? And anyone who knows anything about formative assessment knows that's just good teaching. We know that formative assessment is a natural process that happens in classrooms in order for students and teachers to have this dialogue that we heard Don talk about. And we also heard him say that we need to know what students know. And we need to know that daily, minute by minute. That's the formative assessment. That is the broadest end of this alligator because it's what we do most, right? If you think of data points, how many data points do you have in your classroom on formative assessment? Hundreds, probably, within a day. So we really need to think about building out that formative assessment, and we're doing that. We're doing a really good job of that. Okay, we have, we have great programs like FAME, and we have um, some work that the Tesla Grant's doing in order to bring forth um, some great researchers like Aaron Furtock and others to show us and teach us and make us better at this formative assessment feedback loop thing. Well, as we move down the alligator here, then we have classroom assessment. Well, you know, you kind of have to give that end of unit test or whatever, right? Because somebody told you to. So let's figure out what that should look like. OK. 
Can everybody stand up for me? Okay, I would like everyone off of two feet to jump. One, two, three, jump. Again, one, two, three, jump. One more time. One, two, three, jump. All right, sit down. Now, based on that data, I should be able to say how high each one of you can jump. I don't know about y'all, but I'm wearing heels and a skirt, and my jumping performance today was not awesome. Okay? But that's what we do with assessments. We do that with classroom assessments too, right? They take the end of the unit test. Here's your three data points on that one standard. You're done. A, B, C, D. You're out the door. Why do we do this? It doesn't make any sense. What phenomena were we exploring? Me seeing how high you could jump three times. Why was I doing it? You don't know, right? Just because. So we need to work on these classroom assessments and we need to work on them together so that teachers can understand how assessments are put together they can understand why assessments need to be phenomenon driven, and they can really understand how to read these intense standards that we're tasked with. Performance tax tasks are much the same. We have some work going on in this with the 3D Spa Project. They created nine performance tasks from grades three to 12 over the course of the summer. Really, really great work coming out of it. Who's used it? Yeah, there's been some teachers that have used it. And we have some great people here that are doing that work. But has it gone anywhere? Has it gone further? No. Why? Because we're not talking about it. We're not reaching out for it. We're not making improvements on it. As a global Michigan assessment literacy program. And then we have this darn gap in the middle. We've been talking about this gap for about a year now. Modular assessments, interim assessments, benchmark, the, the county benchmark that all has to be the same for the biology test or for the midterm exam. These are still coming out of our textbooks. They're still coming out of what was written to the old standards. We're starting to move into this space, though. We're starting to understand how we can write really good phenomenon-based assessments and use them in our classrooms. But here's the kicker. We have to be able to take that leap and use them in our classrooms. They can't just sit on a shelf. We can't just say, well, you know, they haven't been tested by Pearson, or they haven't been out there from McGraw-Hill, or they haven't been here. No, they've been created with the thoughtful design of our own Michigan science educators. So we've, we're putting a lot of work into some things, and we need to make sure we're utilizing them and growing that work. And then at the very tip, we have the M step. We're working on that too. Okay, this is where my work is centered, but that work doesn't mean anything if we don't fill out the rest of that alligator, if we don't really think about what we can do with assessments in our classrooms. And in order to do something with assessments in our classroom, classrooms, we have to realize that we have to do something with instruction in our classrooms. And that's happening. I mean, all of you guys are giving fantastic examples of how that's happening. But what these assessments can do once we see them is it can drive that change we need to see in instruction. How many of you have come across that teacher that says, no, I'll just wait until the assessment comes out? then we'll see what happens. Yeah, a couple people? I hear it a lot. It's scary. It's scary to think that these standards came out in 2013, five years ago. We adopted them in 2015, two years ago, and we're getting ready to pilot them now. The change has been coming. The signs have been pointing towards moving instruction. But the assessment is going to do that even further. 
And so that's why we're working so hard at the state and working in classrooms and with classroom teachers to really get people to understand that change is coming. It's not going to be the same old multiple choice assessment. We're not going to ask you to jump three times and evaluate your, your growth on that. Can't work that way. So we need to understand that these, this assessment literacy process, filling out the gaps, is really going to help us form change in our classrooms. And part of that change comes with the structure of how we're looking at making these assessments different. We're thinking about topic bundles. And we say that, I say that a lot, and people go, the what? So we're looking at grouping these standards in a way that's flexible for classroom teachers to use. You can think about a topic of energy or waves or weather or any of those things. And you can say, OK, how can I get my students to pick out a phenomenon, examine it using the three dimensions, and get them engaged in this process? That's up to the experts. That's up to the classroom teachers. No one knows your students, your context, more than you do. And so that's why we intentionally bundled the state assessment in a large way. Does it make it easy for writing? No, it's hard. But it does help teachers see that this structure can be used to adapt anything you need to do in your classroom so that every student has the opportunity to learn this stuff. And every student has the opp opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge. So, with that flexibility comes issues of equity. So now that we have some flexibility in what we can teach and how we can teach, it's scary, but it allows us to address these huge opportunity gaps that we have with our students. Okay, not everyone gets the same shake. Teachers, districts, classrooms, you have control over who and which students get the opportunities that they specifically need in order to understand and know and be able to do science. So while this is a big job, and remember my job description is just a tip, we want to make sure that we're building out the entire vision for assessment so that we can drive instruction, we can push people beyond their comfort zone, we can take that leap that Don was talking about and really attack this alligator. Because if we don't attack it, it's going to attack us and we're going to be in trouble. Thank you.